you know, I talk about improv and role play, and it's oft, almost always for comedy. But for a while, I did it as a hostage uh, role player. So I would, I would play um, meth heads and suicide jumpers, um, all sorts of really horrible scenarios to train law enforcement on how to approach and handle these individuals. And um, it prepared me beautifully for encounters with law enforcement <laughs> in the future, which I gratefully haven't had too many. But I am really good at verbally de-escalating a very tense and even violent situation. Hi, and welcome to Five Random Questions, the show where every question is an adventure. I'm your host, Danny Brown, and each week I'll be asking my guests five questions created by a random question generator. The guest has no idea what the questions are, and neither do I, which means this could go either way. So sit back, relax, and let's dive into this week's episode. Today's guest is Don Brody. Don is a stand-up comedian and historian who appears regularly on History Channel. She's also the host of the top-rated history podcast, Health, where history is a party and everybody's coming. So you can probably guess what Health stands for. She's also a freelance writer for Netflix and Paramount and can be seen as a street improviser at Universal Studios Hollywood. So, Don, welcome to Five Random Questions. Hi, Danny. Thank you for having me. I, that introduction made me sound so cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are. I mean, look at the background. You've got um, a bunch of amazing stuff going on there. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thanks so much. This is so cool. I'm a, I'm a fan of your of your podcast. You were frequently uh, in my ears in this L.A. traffic. <laughs> well, thank you for that. And I'll take that as a big compliment, knowing that some of the stuff you could be listening to as well. So I appreciate that. Thank you. And I mentioned their street improviser. Um, I, I get a kind of feeling what that might be, but is that um, similar to, say, a flash mob, but a, a, um, a lesser, like a reduced scale for people wise, not a lesser scale? Let me get that correct. I don't want to make you sound lesser <laughs> how, and with maybe less you. planning or something. <laughs> What, what's the street improviser? There's there's a few different kinds of street improvisers at Universal. We, they have similar jobs at Disney, where you do a a show for the general public that is primarily improvised based on a character. So, like we have, um, some of them are licensed characters, like the Scooby Doo Gang. <laughs> walks around the park and poses for pictures and chats with you um, and Marilyn Monroe and Shrek and all this kind of stuff. But um, the character I play is a non-licensed character. It's not, she's not from a movie. We're the New York windows. So if you go to Universal Studios Hollywood, there's a point in the theme park where there's a yellow taxi cab and uh, brick, you know, uh, brownstone exteriors and it, and it feels for a block or so like you're in New York. And every... 15-ish minutes. <laughs> we open up the windows on the second floor, our hair in rollers. We're putting out the laundry. We lean out. Oh my, look at you, Danny. Look at you. I haven't seen you since your mother got out of prison, honey. How are you? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, um, and we chat and we, we have a partner that we improvise with. And then we're also improvising with the people that we see down below. And uh, it's great. It's just one of the best jobs on earth. I love it so much. <laughs> and, if you have, and I love the New York accent there, by the way. Kudos. And oh, thank you. <laughs> thank have you. you ever had, you mentioned that you obviously improvise and interact with the, 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 the attendees at Universal uh, Studios. Have you ever had anyone or anybody that saw, Ooh, who are you and sort of came back at you in a not nice way or has everybody been really nice? <laughs> Uh, you know, no, no one's ever been unkind. People are inappropriate sometimes, <laughs> but oh. I always count those generally as errors of errors of enthusiasm. You know, these these folks aren't they're not wasted. They're not trying to be jerks. They just are playing differently. <laughs> you know, it's like when you see a puppy play with a big dog, <laughs> you know, and they want to come at you with the language they would use in the bar after 10 o'clock, um, even though it's still playful and lighthearted, you're like, ah, you can't yell that in the middle of Universal Studios. You know what I mean? But rarely, really. I mean, there's there's a real um, uh, kindness. There's a real sort of understanding to people in large crowds, I've found. I'm from the middle of nowhere, and I've lived in big cities since I've been 18. <laughs> so I feel like I've kind of noticed the difference, you know? And I always feared crowds, you know, because it thought I thought, Jesus, chaos, fucking people. Excuse my language. I swear I mean, yes, so much. <laughs> okay. I will do my best to self-regulate. Um, there's, you know, you think these are chaos. These are animals. People are nuts. And so surely when you're in a huge group of people, it's got to feel nuts. And I'm always kind of impressed when huge groups of people seem to just, in, in a way, link arms and get like, 
Nobody's trying to make anybody's day harder. We're all just trying to move without spilling this beer on my shirt. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm yeah. sure because obviously you've got the stand-up background, you could pretty much easily handle anybody that comes at you. You've got heckling experience, I would imagine, and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's a bit of Tai Chi, right? You want to sort of deflect and put a stop to it in a way that doesn't alienate the audience or, or villainize anybody and keeps the party going, but also lets the person in the back who might be thinking of the same thing nothing that doesn't look like any fun <laughs> what happened to that person yeah um but you know it's it is it is amazing that um outside before i started comedy uh the, i th- worried about heckling i thought about stuff like that and really the reality is uh similar Mo- the, it is really rare that someone just wants to um dis- disrupt it's usually something that's happening because they're they just are doing it wrong they're trying to get in there and they don't know how <laughs> you know I know I, I watch one of my favorite comedians is uh, Jeff Arcuri, um, who's like a mm. New York Italian um, comedian. Um, and I, like how he improvises with the, the crowd, he, his crowd work is amazing. Mm. Um, and, and to your point about, you know, when people do try a heckle, he does it in a really, when he comes back to them, he does it in a real kind way that brings them back on side. Uh, so yeah. to your point, I, I feel like most, most people that go to something to be entertained, you've paid money for that. You, you don't want to have idiots in the bar, you know spoiling it for a the performer on stage and the rest of the audience yeah and and heckling means you're listening usually <laughs> right it's sort of like i mean i'm i'm a mom i have a six-year-old daughter and and i think sometimes that it is a bit like being a good teacher you know what i mean you have a really disruptive student who's asking too many questions or who's talking over someone else it's like that's so frustrating but like that kid's in your class man they're listening to you do you know how hard it is to just get people to listen to you and to want to react to feel a, des- a desire to i mean and this is excluding the hecklers who aren't just like spilling beer on someone and screaming penis because they think their buddy will like it that's different <laughs> you know they should be sent to the to the proverbial principal's office no matter what <laughs> you know no matter what but well i feel when you have kids we've got two kids that are a bit older than yours now they're uh, mm. 14 and 12 but when they were <sighs> your daughter's age um no filters so you no. know it's a, a good training ground for adults to how to handle you know people yeah. coming towards you with no filters I got to tell you, I literally thought for your podcast, five random questions, I was like, no chance they get more random than the questions that are coming at me these days. You know, like, how does electricity come out of a sake? And I'm like, God, you know, that's great. Wow, that's a great question. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know exactly how it comes out. I don't know. No, and I still can't. I mean, you know, I'm in my 50s now and I still can't get my head around how pictures appear on a TV screen through a wire. It's like people were there live at the time doing a sport yeah. event or music event. Yeah. And it, the crowd at the event is seeing it at the same time as you, but you're only seeing it through a wire. It just yeah. blows my mind. Yeah, me too. I've exp- I said there's bowls in outer space. I said we're shooting information into the bowls in outer space, and then they reflect off the bowls and shoot it back down. I'm like, that's all I got, kid. <laughs> that's, just, that's like you're the, the depth of my understanding is now imparted to you. Good luck. <laughs> That, that's good enough. I feel that's good. Yeah, enough. I agree. <laughs> well, speaking of random questions, Don, mm. I feel it's time to bring up the five random questions for you this week. So, are you ready for this? Can't wait. Awesome. I'm just going to bring up the random question generator so we can see that and we'll take it from there. Okay, a nice, easy one to start, I feel. Oh. Okay, Don, question number one What sound do you love? Um,. I love the sound of an idle boat um, gurgling. Just, you know, when you've pulled a, 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 any size boat up to a dock and before you shut the engine off or before you untie and push off, there's a real like low, like blah, 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 <laughs> gurgle <laughs> that is, uh, oh, I love that sound. Yeah. So where do you think that came from? Do you think that's like... um? I mean, did you like, used to like, you know, like making these sounds in a bath, for example? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> probably, I mean, I did. I grew up in the middle of nowhere uh, on a pond, my uh, 85 acres of, of farmland in Wisconsin. And uh, we had a, a pond that my dad had dug to be from like a natural like stream. So we, we always were on the water and playing in the water. But I think more, more influentially, um, I lived aboard a houseboat on the Mississippi River in St. Paul, Minnesota for Mm. um, about nine years and uh, took at one point a huge trip down the Mississippi 
the entire length of the river. And it was just some of the best years of my life. And I, and it's so funny because if you had asked what sound do you love, I, you know, I don't know, you know, I, at first I'm like laughing at my daughter, but I heard, cause I haven't been on my boat in a long time. <laughs> and I recently heard a boat gurgling and idle. And I, I mean, it hit me like a sledgehammer, you know, I kind of put my hands over my heart. Like, like I was smelling grandma's bread, you know? So, mm. That's kind of cool. So was that like a, a family tradition or how did that come about? Because that's, that's unusual to hear. Um, I mean, it may be a, a more regular thing in, in Mississippi, for example, but it's un, unusual for me to hear. It is unusual for where I did it too. I didn't, St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, Minnesota, among, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. Among the reasons why it was sort of an unusual thing to do there is because our winters are brutal. I mean, you're in Canada, you understand brutal winters, <laughs> but um uh, yeah, really, really cold. And I lived aboard year round for nine years. So living on a boat on the Mississippi River in St. Paul in the winter is a whole like, whew, that was, that was, uh, and I made it up. I mean, there's only about four or five of us that really did it. <laughs> so there's no website, there's no TikTok. Well, e even though those websites didn't even really exist at the time I was doing it anyway. But even so, even with, with the further reach of information, it was just sort of a, a figuring it out. Um, but I wanted to, the, the real bottom line, Danny, is that um, I had just always thought that living on a boat sounded like the coolest thing in the world. So when I was 27, I graduated from college and I was in a kind of unique life situation, broke as a joke. <laughs> uh, and living on a boat happened to be cheap. It was like, it was a mortgage because it's a house. Um, and I, and it was like a couple hundred dollars a month and I could live by myself and I could try this cool thing. And I thought maybe I'd do it for a few years and then I could sell the boat and that say I'd done it. But once I was aboard, I couldn't leave. <laughs> that, and so nine years later. So what happened? Did you then meet someone and decide to move inland, so to speak? Or? I know, right? Yeah, really. My, um, I'm married now to a dude who I met. <laughs> a dude. He's my dude. <laughs> uh, um, I had lived aboard alone for about three years. And then he was a lubber, a land lubber. <laughs> oh. And uh, he, but he came aboard, so to speak, <clears throat> and we joined uh, together and moved into a bigger boat and then took my boat that I had lived on alone on that big trip down the Mississippi River and sort of an adventure. And then after that, we um, moved into a, an RV and drove to L.A. And so after nine years on the river, we thought, let's be uh, let's get a land boat <laughs> and see what's going on over there in the deep end of the pool, you know. That's very cool. I mean, that, that's a really interesting background for oh. living arrangements to go from, you know, obviously you had your houseboat, then a, a, a co-joined houseboat, if you like, and then the <laughs> yeah. RV going across the US to LA, etc. Yeah. Do you have plans to do any more adventuring now that your daughter's a bit older or are you sort of settled now or? I don't, yeah, for sure. As a matter of fact, uh, she's pretty good at going on adventures, you know, and I guess I had sort of presumed that comparatively my life would be settled uh, down a little bit. I live in a boring old house, <laughs> doesn't go anywhere, you know, uh, it's got bathrooms and all sorts of boring stuff, walls. Um, and, but then, uh, you know, COVID hit and COVID was like, hey, you can do whatever you want, kind of, you know, like for all the barriers there are, there's also some wide open spaces. And so um, we got a pop-up camper. We had been out of the RV for a while, living in condos and such uh, with the kiddo. And uh, so I thought, oh my God, this is the first time I'm in a house and I feel so stuck. And uh, so the pop-up camper was great. We went to Yosemite and uh, she loves a road trip. She camps, she sleeps, you know, uh, in a camper, no problem. And um, we took her to Italy <laughs> for a trip with with some family, and and boy, she chow ragazzi her way right around. <laughs> no problem. Um, you know, you think more. I have more of an eye to safety, but um, safety doesn't ruin a every adventure. You know, <laughs> put some water wings on and still jump pretty high. So. That's very cool. I, I'm very jealous. I know like oh. I did a bit of backpacking for six months in Australia years and years ago, but that's mm. about the, the level of my adventuring. Um, so very jealous. Maybe the wife and I can uh, 
do some of that once the kids are maybe on their own, get college or whatever they're going to do when they're a little bit older. Yeah, yeah. Because you take them now, they're just going to call you names, right? 12 and 14, is that right? <laughs> yeah, they do that now. So why would they be different abroad? <laughs> Let them do it in the Grand Canyon. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, speaking of, and thanks for that, when speaking of adventures, I think it's a time to adventure on into question number two. Let's see what pops up. Hmm, interesting. So question two, Dom. What's a common thing that you think about when you're alone? Oh, a common thing that you think about when you're alone. Oh, uh, I think probably, boy, I'm alone most of the time these days because I work from home alone. I guess most of the time I'm thinking about history. I mean, oh, that's not a very good answer. But yeah, I'm probably I'm probably thinking about history or I'm making up dialogue and I'm actually talking out loud when I'm alone. I'm I'm often still talking. <laughs> it's probably not hard for you to believe that I never shut up. Um and uh sometimes I just sort of am thinking about alternate scenarios, whether from big history or from my own personal history. And I'm often sort of walking down a path of either known known events or or potential events and playing them out. Oh, that sounds, that's really, <laughs> I was such a good question. No, but I mean, if that's your passion and obviously, you know, yeah. with your show, with your podcast and also your degree and everything, that's, you know, if that's your passion, it makes sense that when you've got time to think, you, you know, you're thinking about that. You, you'd mentioned about um, what ifs and you know, alternate realities, you know, based mm. on history. So just to follow up on that, then, this is still question two. It's a little bonus um, addition. I love it. If you could insert yourself into uh, an alternative part of history because of your insertion, mm. what would that be and, and maybe why that one? Ooh. In alternate history, you mean uh, um, like an inglorious bastard sort of deal? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Or even, you know, if, if you could see like um, kind of like the, 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 the 9 11 23 book by Stephen King, where, yes. you know, they talk about the alternative, you know, history there, for example. Uh huh. Uh huh. Oh, boy. Well, first of all, I would sit down with, with three bottles of Jack Daniels, unless this was like you have to decide right now and then I, you know, but I would have to sit down and really chew on stuff because I have seen Back to the Future a lot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I kn- and I just have always had a sense of the significant ripple uh, a small pebble can make in the in the short and long range of history. And I would be just so afraid that I would somehow, uh, you know, hurt Michelle Obama by, <laughs> you know, putting a stop to some horrible event. You know what I mean? Um, so provided that I had all of the historical disclaimers sufficient to know that I wasn't truly effing up. <laughs> <laughs> Another really great track of history. Um, oh, this is kind of morbid, dude. Okay, all <laughs> this is why we're here. I think I would go to medieval Europe right before the first wave of the plague. So uh, the good news is if I get to run the time machine, I can enter the appropriate coordinates. And that means that I would go to like Genoa in 1340. And I'd feel nice and safe from the plague. <laughs> I'd be super sure not to get pregnant. And then <laughs> and then I would uh, experience some of the like pre-plague Europe. And I would also maybe try to prepare the humans on Earth for what is about to be the greatest horror show in human history, which I wouldn't be able to necessarily prevent, but could maybe get some of our... Uh, knowledge documented some of the some of the wisdom that we had accumulated that was lost um into somebody's really great clay jar <laughs> you know i wonder if you'd be like seeing that's a really cool one by the way i mean obviously i'm from the uk originally so i've got you know european history is like you know, something i really we got taught a lot of at school but um i'm wondering if you would maybe be seen as a witch because oh, you're coming yeah. with all this these like crazy theories that they that you know the the thirteenth century people or the fourteenth century, you know, people would be looking at saying you're talking crazy language. What what is even this that you're talking about? Hmm. 
Yeah, I'd have to watch my ass. That's a very good point. But, you know, I have had a lot of weird jobs, and one of them was as a, <laughs> you know, I talk about improv and role play, and it's oft, almost always for comedy. But for a while, I did it as a hostage uh, role player. So I would I would play um, meth heads and suicide jumpers, um, <laughs> all sorts of really horrible scenarios to train law enforcement on how to approach and handle these individuals. And um, it prepared me beautifully for encounters with law enforcement (laughs) in the future, which I gratefully haven't had too many. But I am really good at verbally de-escalating a very tense and even violent situation. Um, I like to think that something similar might be in my back pocket if I found myself accused of witchcraft in the Middle Ages. (laughs) You know what I mean? I'm so, I'm super literate. Like that alone will give me a lot of protection from a lot of people. Um, I'd I'd make sure to carry at least three or four Bic lighters and like laser pointer pens with me just to really blow their hair back in a bind. (laughs) You know what I mean? Um, So I, I, uh, but no, I think, you know, three big guys with a club corner me in my cottage. I'm I'm toast. I'm well. You could always introduce them to JD, right? Have some JD, JD and Cook on on rocks or something, and get, get introduce them to that, and maybe they'll be a bit more, you know, friendlier. Exactly. That's a good point. That's a good point. Be like everybody, relax. I got some spirits that I think you guys are going to be very interested in. We've really refined some things. <laughs> what about you? I'm curious to know what you think about when you're alone. You know what? It's 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 weird because I don't really get a lot of well, especially at the moment. Anyway, I don't get a lot of time alone because um, we had a flood a few months back um, in the summer actually in our basement and because of the insurance company screwed us over I'm dealing with that at the moment and doing all the repairs myself so finish work in the day do repairs in the evening weekends same kind of thing and what have you trying to build a basement back up but I guess um, maybe I'm, I'm starting to think more about mortality um, because uh-huh. you know I'm, I'm well into the second half or second stage of my life if you like um, or second, third, 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 whatever. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> well into it anyway. So probably because I've got two younger kids. I had kids when I was older. And my wife's a little bit younger than me. Um, so she's more, um, a- I'm not going to say age appropriate because that makes me sound a bit pervy, but it's not very, very <laughs> nice at all. Um, but I, there's like a, a, like a 13 year difference um, between us. And so because of that, she's more the age of what a parent would be with teenage kids, for example, whereas I'm mm-hmm. an older dad. So I, I guess maybe... I, I can, maybe I think about will I be here to see them th- into adulthood? Uh, hopefully I will, because it's not that far away. So maybe something like that to continue the morbid theme. Yeah, right there we go. Well, and s- similar. I'm I'm 46, and my husband's like seven, almost eight years younger than me, and I don't really l- seem like an old mom uh, unless I rush out the door and it's really bright sunlight, and I look in the rearview mirror and I'm like, oh. Who is this crypt keeper driving your young baby around? Yuck. <laughs> <laughs> I like that when I put my glasses on. I have these glasses for like, a, I'm farsighted, which means I struggle with small print. I think that's the right term. Um, but I'm fine. I can like look outside, drive a car or whatever without them. But when I put them on, that's when I'm in the bathroom, for example. And I go, oh my God, who are you? <laughs> who just came into the bathroom with me? <laughs> so I hear you there. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I need an adult. Oh, I'm the adult in the room. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. All right. Well, that was a, a nice, I like the morbid take there, but I like also the fact that you're doing it to save the world and to help the world. So yeah. that's, a, that's a nice um, a nice alternate history there for sure. So let's see what we have for question number three. Hmm. Well, I guess this is kind of the flip side of what, we, what your answer was just now. So question number three, Don, mm-hmm. what are you most looking forward to in the next 10 years? Oh, this is a good yeah. As a as a um, um, history lover, I rarely dance into the future. This is kind of fun. <laughs> um, Ten years into the future, you know, this is gonna oh, this is gonna be a romantic answer. I uh, have been married to a wonderful guy uh, for nine years, and we are just uh, doing great. He's awesome. We're but we we were friends for years before we started smooching, and I gotta believe that like. I don't think it's the answer for everybody, but boy, howdy. I met a lot of uh, slick guys in bars that were a lot of fun, but <laughs> they, I love you. I love you too. This is so great. It was not great uh, long-term. Um, 
and it, we've just been having this awesome life together. I gotta be honest. It's, it's been great. And he is presently approaching what seems to be something like a pinnacle of his professional life. You know, like he's, he's getting exciting jobs uh, and projects. He, he's, he's working on very cool things that curl toes all over the place. And, um, and I'm similarly really loving what I'm doing professionally, what I'm getting to do with my kid. And I think in the next 10 years, we'll see something like the possible fullness of that. You know, the, the, I mean, I guess if we're shooting arrows into the future, that 10 years from now is kind of where we're aiming. So, Mm. um, I, the, the next 10 years, I look forward to walking that path and that also having lived a life with a lot of unexpected, fuck, excuse me, twists and turns. <laughs> um, also knowing that the 10 years, they, those will continue to happen in the next 10 years. I'm also okay with that. And can you see yourself still where you are now or would you maybe be put in, I mean, I'm guessing your, your daughter will be like a mid-teen then. Um, uh, high school so would you see yourself maybe pulling her out of high school and doing a bit of travelling or wait until that's done and re-travelling or what, anything on that, that horizon you think? Unforeseen circumstances could make that a very cool thing to do and I would be very open to doing that presently perhaps because of our sort of nomadic <laughs> journey up until this point I think the plan is to stay in this house and to stay in this school system until she graduates. Um, I'm, I'm in the L- L- LAUSD, baby, Los Angeles Unified School District. And we really like, we really like it. It's our, our public assigned school. I'm not paying out the nose as some of my uh, fa- other families are, you know. And, um, and both my husband and I had that. <clears throat> our parents, we didn't move around a lot. My parents divorced, but I got to stay in the same town and, and stuff. And, and we both believe and have seen and, and and can empathize that for many of the people we know and love, some of the most devastating um, elements were a lot of moving in these years, having to restart and make new friends and start over. So I wouldn't put that in there unless, you know, it, it came up. But in, in 15 years, girl, <laughs> when she's 18, bah, bitch, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I love you and everything. And I'm going to follow you very closely. And you can always come home and I will take care of you and give you the blood out of my veins until the day you die. But bye bye, your father and I will be rescuing you from wherever we've ended up. And I don't know where that is. I suspect that once she's untethered, he and I will probably return to something of a of a Lord of the Rings sort of hobbiton. <laughs> Get over to New Zealand, live the life there. Yeah. Well, I do like the fact that you mentioned as well that your husband and you were friends, long-time friends beforehand. Mm-hmm. I feel that removes a lot of the, the weirdness where sometimes, especially when you're younger as well, less so as you get older and you, you start to you know think less about that. But when you're younger, you're trying to impress the, mm. the, the person you're interested in. So you, you might come out and, and embellish some stuff about you that's not a lie, but maybe not quite true either. All but right. that causes problems down the line. Whereas you're a friend with someone, they see your warts, they see all your bad sides along with your good sides. They know what to expect and that, that negates all these issues down the line that could sort of pop up afterwards. Yeah, I think I agree with with that entirely because I think that when you uh, are, so I, I can speak for myself, in your twenties and single, and out in the various places where you're meeting people, you are definitely pitching and selling the absolute best version of you. And you know, there's the joke about like you don't want to fart or poop at his house, and you all these things that you're doing to sort of bolster this illusion. And the idea is that there is some imaginary date in the future and it might be our wedding day that I can fucking like let my gut out and shave my armpits in the shower while you're brushing your teeth and that this will be like (laughs) totally fine and like nobody loses it but I I in my experience have not found that to be true and one of the things I had with my husband Andrew is that we were buddies so long that like I didn't I was never the guarded like that around him so he knew about my booty call and that just like 
dumb idiot guy that I keep going out with. And he knew the way I spoke about my family, which is, I, I love them. I always speak highly of my family. You know what I mean? Like versus that impulse you might have to be like, my mom, she's such a bitch. I can't stand because you want to put on some sort of tough guy thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like, I, you know, that kind of thing and same with him. And yeah. How did you meet your wife? How'd you get cradle robber? How'd you get your 13 <laughs> years younger bride there, Danny? No, it was, it's, a, it's a long system. I'm going to keep it really abridged. Um, but essentially, um, both of us are huge fans of the band Dashboard Confessional. Yeah. Um, so we were on their official website stroke fan forum kind of thing way back 2005, um, I'm going to say. But yeah, 2005 it was actually, 2005. And I'm because I've got a Scottish background, um, I dropped some um, recommendations for Scottish punk music that Chris, the uh, lead singer of uh, Dashboard, had said it influenced him when he was growing up. Um, mm. So Jacqueline, my wife, she, her granddad, uh, although she's Canadian, her granddad was from Glasgow in Scotland. So she's got mm. that Scottish background. And she thought, oh, Scottish music, I've got Scottish background, interested. So I started reading it. And we got talking and chat. and she liked the way I wrote stuff or what have you. And then we, I was just innocent for like six months or so. And then something just weirdly clicked online. So she came over for a visit to the UK in October yeah. that year. Um, we got on like a house on fire. I came to Canada in December of that year for a visit, meant to go back in January after the Christmas period, stayed here, and 18 later, eighteen years later, here we are, two kids, proverbial dog, house, you know, blah, blah. Oh, ding, ding. You got a Hallmark movie coming. Yeah, well, I, I think we'd have to do an R-rated Hallmark movie. <laughs> Great. Again. We'll spell we'll spell Hallmarks with three X's at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Love it. <laughs> Hey there, Danny here. This podcast will forever be free to listen to. But if you enjoy five random questions and get value from the show and want to support it, you can do that with a donation of your choosing over at fiverandomquestions.com forward slash support. And thanks so much for supporting the show. Now, back to this week's episode. So uh, that's... Question number three. We're doing really well here. I'm loving your answers here, Don. So thank you for oh. being so open, which I knew you would be anyway. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. I'm honored. So let's have a look at what we can see for question number four. <laughs> All right. <laughs> would you rather look like a potato or feel like a potato? Oh, wow. Well, that's not fair to potatoes, man. Well, let me, th I feel like if we're being negative, if, it, if, the, if the thing is we'd rather look like kind of a big, round, fat, lazy bum, if that's the intention of, or feel like a fat, lazy bum, um, I would say I would 100% every time look like a fat, lazy bum. I have felt like a fat, lazy bum and looked amazing at the time and didn't have any more fun in my life or accomplish anything great. <laughs> so, uh, and I have been potato-esque and I know potato-esque people who rock it and have great uh, life. So if that is the implication, but if we're talking to like literal potatoes. <laughs> yeah. So you got like really dry flaky, well not flaky skin, you got skin that's just peeling off in strips. You got a lot of beardy stuff going on and sprouts coming out like cordyceps <laughs> sticking at the top of your head. Well, then I would rather feel like a potato because what potential? You can be french fries, you can be scalloped, you can be baked. You can, I mean, I feel like a potato metaphorically feels like opportunity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about you? <laughs> no, I mean, that's a really random question, though. It's random, girl, but I uh, I answered it twice, so I don't know what that says about me. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know, because like you say, I mean, it's it's such, such a weird one, you know, is it about the vegetable, is it, you know, metaphorical as in, I don't yeah. even know how metaphorical you'd be, like, as you say, maybe like size or shape or something, but yeah. again, you've got so many different kinds of potatoes, right? And are you going to yeah. be red? Are you going to be yellow? Are you going to be, you know, russet? Are you going to be... Yeah, those little golden ones, they're adorable. Who wouldn't want to be one of those adorable little yellow potatoes? Exactly, right? And then you could like you, you could become your, your potato. You could bring that as an next street imp improvisation thing. Okay, it's potato yeah. clan coming out. And then just get people to sort of, I don't know, I'll leave that to your your <laughs> crazy mind there to come up with something for that. But yeah, that's like, um, I don't know. I feel I'd probably want to be, you know, I'd like to be a mashed potato maybe. Oh, sh smooth. A smooth, creamy guy. 
Yeah, you got to mash it down properly. Don't go, don't be leaving these lumpy chunks in there because now you're just talking turnips or whatever. Yeah, then I may as well have stayed a potato. Why would I even bother getting mashed if you're going to leave all these lumps? I think we've really examined this one. I think that question didn't know how much we were going to think about it. <laughs> well, no, I think so. So there you go, folks. If you want to be a potato, you have to really think about it and go down the whole rabbit hole of mashed, boiled, baked, roasted, mm. all kinds of stuff. And if you want some advice on the best potato approach, get in touch with Don. I have a lot of ideas. A lot of ideas. So let's have a look and see what question number five is. All right, this is a good one to finish on, I feel. Um, and I feel you've got probably some good examples here. What was the last experience? So question number five, what was the last experience that made you a stronger person? Um, oh, well, I'll tell you, there's one actually very recent front of mind because I took a uh, kickboxing class. <laughs> Uh, my daughter has just started doing martial arts and um, she loves it. And I love that she loves it. And I have worked out and I've had sort of like a, a, a physical workout life that's been pretty consistent forever. I, in my younger years, ran marathons, um, but I would never uh, even then have considered myself excuse me, really an athlete. <laughs> I would never have considered myself an athlete because, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, I, st I smoke a lot of dope and I drink Jack Daniels and I don't necessarily identify with, <laughs> with some of the healthier versions. <laughs> All of that being said, um, for this reason, I've never been great at like a Pilates class or a running group or like a committed person assignment reoccurring thing that is part of my fitness. But when I signed my daughter up for martial arts at this dojo, they give the parents a month free, right? And I had thought, oh, theoretically, isn't this great? Because it's right between her school and our house. And if I love kickboxing all of a sudden, then this is great because I drop her off at school. I'll go to kickboxing for uh, an hour and then I get groceries and then I go home and look at you, mother of the year with a tight bod. This is going to be great. <laughs> but I ended up, you know, the three and a half weeks to go by and I'm not doing that for the same reason I hadn't done it prior to the <laughs> since I'm asking me because I don't want to do that because I don't like people yelling at me. I don't like being, I don't like being surrounded by mirrors while I'm trying something new. I don't, you know, there's a lot <laughs> of stuff, but, um, my husband and I said that we were going to do it and I said I was going to do it. And here's me, of course, saying literally to my daughter, literally in this space, I know it's scary, but you got to try something new. Don't be afraid about looking dumb. Everybody's going to be nice to you, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like in my ear, like, come on, come on, come on, you know. And um, so we did it. On Monday morning, we dropped her off. Fuck. And I said the whole time, I was like, oh, God, we got to do this dumb shit. Oh, Jesus, I can't believe I said <laughs> I was going to do this. And then we got in there and it was awesome. And it was just sort of this one-on-one -on -one deal. And the guy was great. The, the, the sensei was great. And there were not a lot of people there, no other people there. So we got kind of one-on-one -on -one attention. Oh, wow. And my body is so sore still because it was a great workout. And my hip hurts and my arms are sore. And it was a really good workout. Now, of course, I think I'm going to try to go every Monday. And, um, and so it, the, that one, I, I was one of those few experiences that in the moment I was like, I don't want to do this and then told myself to do it because it's good for you and then did it anyway and came, learned lesson. I'm, I am giving the right advice to my daughter and it happens to be good advice even <laughs> when it's coming back at me. This is, this is encouraging. This is good, you know. So extra bonus points there then. You get the, yeah. like you say, you've got your daughter involved and, and something that's amazing, obviously, because of the... A, the self-defense part, but just the confidence yeah. as well. Like I find yeah. um, a lot of martial art instills confidence in a person, right? It's not always, well, it's not about fighting. It's to protect yourself and protect others. But the confidence side, especially for, you know, a, a young kid uh, to to get that confidence in case, you know, you, you meet not nice people, you know, um, at school or whatever. Yeah. And even just being able to yell, like there's, there's a real element <laughs> of it that says that you punch harder when you go, Ugh! you know, and I think that kids in, in elementary school, maybe especially girls are told to keep quiet. Don't make, don't be loud. Don't disrupt. And so I like that for, you know, 45 minutes a day, a couple days a week, she's told louder get louder, be heard, make noise, punch that guy. You know, it's okay. It's all things in moderation means all things. And I like, I like that. So. 
Would you find that's more like, a, or sorry, not more, but that's less prevalent now where, like you said, um, and I know certainly when I was younger and at school, um, and even when I was a teen, um, we were in a very traditional Scottish household where my mum did all the, the menial work. She'd like do all the dishes and then the laundry and the vacuum and all that. And thankfully it has changed, but you've still got that aspect where girls are told something different than boys, you know, and... Do you think that's changing in the education system for the better? Or do you think that's still an issue in places are? You know, I feel like this is such an interesting thing to chase because, yes, it's still pr- around, but it's not imposed in the same way that I suspect it has been in decades past. Um you know, the, there there doesn't seem to be a big line between boys and girls. But I'm t- and my husband and I uh, have have in our family and in our circle of friends uh, a real uh, diaspora of types of relationships from single moms to the you know stepdads to two moms and two dads and married. Uh, you know, t- she knows this is in her life, right? And I'm shocked. At what a like f- like anti feminist homophobe she is, and just her like <laughs> default. I'm I'm joking, of course, but I mean she says two boys can't get married. Like she's my grandfather, and I look at her and I go, "What do you mean?" And she goes, "That's just I don't understand that." And you're like, "Oh my god, what do you mean?" And it's because there is, I think, um, a, 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 a certain element that is put on in her. Her fiction has not caught up with her real life, and her fiction is pretty uniformly girls and boys. You know, there's a real hmm. the and and division of labor, like. Like one of there's a princess on on the Disney Channel um, that I'm gonna forget her name and probably couldn't say anyway because of the, I you know the mouse will show up at my door immediately but um, and it's very cool because she's like a stepdaughter and she wasn't born into royalty and she's just like figuring out how to be a princess and um, it's in Spain I think somewhere anyway she's great. But, like, she's still beautiful and wears exclusively princess dresses. And all of her friends are beautiful and wear exclusively princess dresses. And all of the boys are prince. So there's still, I think, a lot of, like, what she feels she can do as a girl that has permeated her brain beyond what we're telling her and showing her and what her teachers are telling her and showing her. That my hope is, though, that it's superficial. That perhaps the difference is that back in the day, it was like we had the same assumptions, but they were deeply ingrained because they were reinforced in all of these places versus a real superficial uh, belief that will be, um, you know, (laughs) vacated soon. There's there's not a lot of girls. I'll tell you the truth. There's not a lot of girls in her karate class, but there's enough. She's not the only one. And that maybe that's progress, you know. No, for sure. And I know exactly what you mean. We watched, um, when the kids were a bit younger, uh, we watched, um, so Big Hero 6 is a movie that we love. It's a Disney movie. Yes. Um, and I, the story behind that is just amazing. But they also did like a Baymax show on its own. Not the, the weirdly animated one, one that followed the the CGI style of the, the movie. And it was just six little mini episodes, maybe five minutes each episode, something like that. And what I loved about that was they talked about really adult, um, things or coming of age things that made it really simple for kids to understand. So we were watching it and they were talking about your first period. They were talking about same sex attraction and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was so cool to see that in a kids show that explained it really easily so kids could understand. So like like you say, I feel Don, it's um, there's still obviously Disney princesses and Disney heroes, you know, like the big strong heroes with the chisel jaw and everything like that. Um, but I do feel that it's, it's like you say, it's getting better and the uh, the more realism that's around, you know, your daughter and other kids, where it's natural to have same sex uncles or, you know, aunties or parents or whatever, um, and all that, everything that comes into that, it it can only be better from when I was your daughter's age, for example. Yeah, I think so. And I think I think another way that that we can sometimes mitigate some of these factors is by looking more at who's telling her that she is free to uh, find representation wherever she wants. Like I I remember as a kid, like I, I had no problem seeing myself as Huckleberry Finn. 
I had no problem seeing myself as Jack Sparrow. You know what I mean? I was, and I, there was no confusion at all. It was just like every other person who feels pulled into a character's story and can see themselves in that character. And I don't think that we need to make it more complicated than that. That, that just don't feel confined by whatever someone tells you, you know, you are, you can, you can feel yourself in lots of places, even if it doesn't look like you. And that way you don't have to necessarily tell someone else you shouldn't be that because it makes me feel like I'm being reflected badly. It's like, hey, you can stay out of other people's business with this approach and just you find yourself, uh, you know, reciprocating from these places. Wise words indeed. And I think I'm going to use that actually as a little side adjunct now uh, for <laughs> reciprocation. You've been very kind to be open with your five answers for the five random questions. So it's the stage of the show, a stage of the episode, but it's only fair to allow you to throw it over to you to ping a, a random question back my way to take the pressure off you now for the what you've put, <laughs> put through for the last 30, 40 minutes or so. Oh, I'm so glad. Okay, well, uh, my question for you is, um, if you could have the dinner party with three people, living or dead, real or fictional, who do you invite and why? That's... See, I've always wondered about this because uh, you see them on Facebook and stuff like that all mm -hmm. the time, right? The little, hey, what if, what if, who, who do you invite? And it, it's, I, I'm glad you mentioned fictional there because normally it's like, who would you invite? Uh, living or dead, and that's it. Um, so I'm going to go with a mix, I think. Fictional, I'm going to have Gollum because yeah. you get two for one there. <laughs> and I think he would just be so entertaining, but also cause shit <laughs> and, <laughs> and you don't have to worry about the menu you don't have to be too particular about what you prepare exactly so i think he covers <laughs> a lot of bases and he takes the pressure off you as a host at that great dinner, you know great. so i'm gonna go with gollum um i'm gonna go I, yeah i think i think i'm gonna go rosa parks but younger really younger rosa parks to see what like, obviously, you know what made her into the person she was and, you know, what she stood for and, and what that resulted in. But what really, like the early years, what really shaped, you know, what, what did she go through? What, what, what lessons can she teach, you know, mm. future generations that are still going through what she's gone, you know, she went through? Because of all the good and all the, the activism that resulted because of what happened, you know, with Rosa Parks, we still have issues across the world. You know, mm -hmm. um, with bigotry, racism, hate and everything. And it feels like as much as many lessons were learned, some weren't and continue not to be. So how can we take some of her earlier lessons and, and make that? Um, so I feel that be a good, or she'd be an amazing mm. person. And then I think probably I'm going to go for another fictional one. And I'm going to go with probably Star-Lord from the... Um, galaxy, uh, Gardens of the Galaxy franchise. I don't know. I feel, I mean, that could have gone either way. It could have been Star Lord. It could be Chris Pratt, obviously, the actor that plays him. Sure. Who I feel is a, a funny guy. As it. Same with Ryan Reynolds. I mean, I might have to switch out with Ryan Reynolds. Oh. Who knows? Because, I mean, I've got a massive man crush on him as well. So that could be, maybe I shouldn't invite him because my wife might not, <laughs> not approve. Right. And you'd be so him. embarrassed when Gollum made a scene. You'd be like, I'm so sorry, Ryan. I don't know why I invited him. <laughs> exactly so maybe not but yeah I feel Star-Lord I think that character is just he's, he is funny um, but he's also dumb right but he's dumb in a a naive because he was like taken from Earth as a kid so he's always got that kid mindset which is amazing that's the the kind of mindset I feel you should have for a, a cynical world right so have a really kind childlike mindset and I feel his naivety and his wisecracking would counter off of Gollum and whatever crap he comes out with and then Rosa would be sitting there saying, who did this person and why did he invite me <laughs> to come eat with these two idiots? So I feel that might be like a, an interesting oh table. But thank you for that. That's a, a, an interesting question that you've actually made me think about it properly for a, you know, for a change. So <laughs> good, thanks for that. Good. Well, I can't wait to see the velvet, uh, you know, dogs playing poker version of your dinner party. It would be <laughs> <laughs> quite a piece of art. I almost wonder if AI, you know, like some generative AI could do something around that. Oh, give it that chance. Give it yeah. that chance. And to see what it comes up with. I shall, if it comes up, I'll be, you'll be the first to know. Don't worry Good. about that. <laughs> so Don, as I mentioned, I mean, I've really enjoyed chatting with you and I feel 
you know, I'm going to um, invite you on for a future five random questions down oh. the line somewhere. Um, I think that's going to be a new rule. That's just come up. Never thought about it before, but I really enjoy chatting with you. So thank you for today. For anybody that wants to learn more about your podcast, learn more about your stand-up in the area or find out if you do any, you know, uh, outside your local area, et cetera, um, and just find out more about your, you know, what you do at Universal, et cetera, where's the best place to find out, listen to your show, find you online, et cetera? Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. This was great, and I really enjoyed it. Um, and uh, folks can find the Hilf podcast, H-I-L-F, um, anywhere you listen, um, uh, Apple and Spotify and YouTube. There's no video, but it's uh, a place where you can also stream it if you have a hard time. Um, and you can follow me on Instagram, Hilf Podcast. And I, I not only post uh, episode clips, but also like you know, fun photos from the most recent episode. Um, and then you can find me, Don Brody, and it's B-R-O-D-E-Y, um, on Instagram or my website, donbrody.com, and that will show you everything that's happening um, coming up. We have in um, November, if you're in and around Los Angeles, I'm going to be hosting an open mic uh, at the... Um, RV park where I moved when I first lived here and it's called the trailer trash talent review and it's wild and fun and kind of the closest thing you'll ever get to like a real life Muppet show. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, in December in the Valley here in Los Angeles, I'm going to be doing Hilf live. So it's going to be in a comedy club. I'm going to have some comedians come in and face off against audience members to see who knows the most about various history and you can find all that stuff in the uh sites i mentioned earlier that sounds very cool i actually know a few people not a few two two people that's not a few <laughs> i know two people in la um so i'll let them know oh. where you're appearing i'll send them over your site you got the details hey. they, they like a, a really good laugh so i'm sure they'll be all up for that and that that sound that live hill fair show sounds quite quite adventurous and fun there thank you it's going to be a blast welcome and i'll also obviously as always i'll leave all these links in the show notes so whatever podcast app you're listening on make sure to check out the show notes and they'll be linking straight through to don's social profiles a podcast website and all the cool places you just mentioned so again don thanks so much for appearing on five random questions thank you thanks for listening to five random questions if you enjoyed this week's episode be sure to follow for free on the app you're currently listening on or online at five random questions.com and if you feel like leaving a review well, that would make me happier than then I went on a trip to discover the history of my name and found out that our family was actually descended from well-regarded storytellers from the Highlands, which seems kind of apt for a podcaster. But seriously, if you want to leave a review, it would make my day. Until the next time, keep asking those questions. Mm -hmm.